The steps I'm describing happened as units or companies were being formed, the first one being A Company and so forth until I, and I said I was assigned to I Company. About the fourth day I was in, the second day I was in Tekoa, and the fourth day I was actually in the Army. Three things were significant about this period in the lives of the men of the 506. At the base of Camp de Corps was a mountain, the last peak and the terminus of the Appalachian mountain range, named Mount Currahee, three and a half miles up and three and a half miles down. It's still there. <laughs> Two, we had twice the number of men needed to comply with the Army table of organization after we got rid of a lot of them doing the physical. And remember, the Army didn't want much to do with us in the first place. We had about 400 cadre people, I repeat, 400 cadre people as our instructors and mentors from the regular Army watching our every move. All of them were non-coms, non-commissioned officers from the rank of corporal to first sergeant. They were our only non-coms at the very beginning. We were all recruits, except the officer personnel who had been recruited from officer candidate schools and universities. They were in every company of the regiment and were handpicked to become part of our unit and expected to train and go into combat when the time came. All the cadre were already jump qualified. The very first day before breakfast, we were told to fall out in front of the barracks. We didn't even know what fall out meant. We were in some of order facing the sergeant. We were then told to turn around. We, later we found out that meant about face, which came later. When we turned, we were told to look up, and there was Currahee staring down on us. It was explained that this was the first phase of our training, and there was a road or path right behind our camp that led to the top of the mountain. The instructions were to start running up that hill. There were about 15 or 20 of the cadre intervals with notebooks to determine if you stopped. If you did stop, it meant that you were no longer with the 506 and it would be, you would be transferred out of the unit on the evening train out of Tekoa. No ands, no ands, ifs, or buts, that was it. As long as you were in the running mode, it was okay. You could go as slow as you wished, but it had to be a run, not a walk. Needless to say, we lost at least another 15% the very first day that this happened to just about all the companies. Some a bit more, of course, and some a bit less. It averaged a loss of at least 15%. We had an obstacle course that the medics announced as inhumane and it had it destroyed. It must have been designed by the devil himself. <laughs> After we finished our basic training, we had more people in the hospital from that obstacle course than we had from our jump training. <laughs> we used the civilian hospital as we had no facilities of our own. The citizens of the Corps were raising hell because they had no room for their own sick folks. The word finally reached our inspector general and he finally took action, as I stated, after we left the Corps. Little side story about the training. Colonel Sink, of course, was a West Point man and in his class, he had a few officers that decided to join the Marine Corps. And I found out the other day that the Marine Corps was actually part of our fighting force. I'm sorry. <laughs> Colonel Sink heard all the bitching that was going on about this 
obstacle course, and he decided to teach us a lesson. He had a buddy of his down in North Carolina with the Marine group, and he called him on the phone. This is what we found out years later. We knew, we saw them, but we didn't know how they came about. He called him and asked, would he bring a company, would his buddy bring a company of Marines up to the Corps to show us how to maneuver that obstacle course? This happened, so help me. When the Marine company got there, they took one look at an obstacle course and wanted to know if we were crazy as hell. They turned around and went back to North Carolina. Before we leave Curahy, let me tell you that it became a regular thing at least two or three times a week. The same basis, if you didn't make it training, you were out. And if you screwed up doing your training for any reason, the instructor could order you a run up and down Curahy for punishment. This is one place you could put the screws on the non-coms. They were too lazy to run the mountain and in most cases, not in shape. So instead of working with us, they were content to watch and give us orders to do and not do themselves. Instead of being exhausted at night and going to bed, most of them were following the old army way and went in town each night to quaff a few beers. For punishment, we would go halfway or a quarter way out of sight on top of the mountain while they waited at the bottom and later amble down. We first would pour a canteen water on our head to show that we'd been perspiring pretty well. <laughs> they never did catch on. They were too dumb. <laughs> I never did fall in love with that damn hill, but after a while, it sort of became routine. I still hate it. After double timing all the time, all the time doing training hours while on the main post, both for officers and men, and marching about 10 to 15 miles to and from our training area just about every day, and then doing your training, we had become hard as rocks. A 25-miler with full field combat load was like going out for an evening stroll. After about 10 weeks in our 10-week, 16-week basic course, in some places, 18 weeks, the instructors could not keep up with their pupils at anything we were supposed to do. Most of them were being replaced by the privates and PFCs. They were not capable either physically or mentally to cope with the new order imposed on them. They were from the army of long ago, and it was sad to see a lot of them go as they had taught us a great deal. While we were on this subject, I can't remember more than about five of the original cadre that jumped into the army that were with my entire battalion. We had three battalions in that regiment. So divide the 400 by the three, you'll get the picture. After about 12 weeks, we were told we were going to have weapons training with live firing for all of our weapons. We had had live firings before many times at our small range, but this time it was to be a real joint effort with the entire regiment at one time. We fell out the next morning and saw dozens of trucks. We thought, what the heck is going on? We never had trucks to carry us anywhere, let alone the ranges. We walked. We ended up at Clemson College, South Carolina, 49 miles away. They had a beautiful firing range. It was, at one time, a military school, and they had huge firing provisions. This was Thursday morning, took about two hours to get there. We used that range all day Thursday, unrolled our sleeping bags and one-man tents, hit the sack, and fired the range all day Friday. The word was to pack up all gear but leave all ship, sh uh, sleeping equipment on the ground to be loaded on the trucks for shipment back to the Corps. This is almost dusk Friday evening. 
We wondered what was going on. After dinner at the school's mess hall, we were told to report to regimental formation on the huge parade ground. Colonel Sink asked us to gather around the best we could to listen to him on the field speaker system. There must have been at least 3,000 men on that field. Orders were to take out our compass, which we of course had, and set it to the direction of the Corps and start walking on our own cross country and report to company headquarters as soon as you reach camp. They expected everybody to be in camp by noon, Sunday. I didn't mind the walk except that I was carrying a light 28 pound machine gun. I was PFC machine gun ashamed at that time and also carried my M1 rifle and basic load and fake grenades to substitute the load. The problem was in between Tekor and us was called Bear Mountain. Pretty tough going and also it was dark as hell. The only thing I had was my compass and the azimuth to Tekor. The azimuth meaning direction of the compass. I don't remember if anyone's permanently lost, but some didn't make it back until Tuesday. <laughs> some went by the way of Atlanta. Atlanta was one heck of a leave town for weekends. Nothing was done or said about the men that took a couple of extra days in Atlanta because at that time it was understood that we had become very good soldiers and really knew what we were capable of doing. We were now ready for the next stage of our Army Odyssey. The total miles for that march was about 50 from Clemson. Now it was time for the 506 to become jump qualified. We have finished our basics at the Corps and on to Benning. Two of the battalions, the second and third, still had too many men and further cuts had to be made. Being the first, the first battalion started first and they were able to weed it out pretty good. When they finished, they had the train to take them to Fort Benning from Tekor. A week later, the second battalion decided to do it the hard way. So they had all their men equip themselves in full field gear and packs and started walking to Atlanta where they caught the train to Fort Benning. They walked about 119 miles in three days. The news media, especially the Atlanta Constitution, went wild. All over the country, they heard about the 2nd Battalion, 506. The next week, the 3rd Battalion was ready to go, and they had even a greater amount of surplus manpower that they had to grit up get rid of because they were the last battalion to form and they picked up all the rest of the men that were not formed the second and first. They decided to ride to Atlanta by train and we wondered what the hell is going on that they're going to give us a ride and then walked the rest of the way to Fort Benning. That was only 147 miles. And let's do it in the same three days. It took the second battalion to walk the 119 miles. We're going to show those SOBs. <laughs> After a while, walking is healthy for you. <laughs> and remember, I must carry that light machine gun all the way, plus about 40 pounds of other stuff. Rules of both games were the same. The officers and non-coms had to make the entire march, or else they were booted from the unit. Even at this late stage of the game, the privates and PFCs had to walk at least 125 miles to make the cut. Needless to say, the unit was able to thin down after both marches to meet the goal of the table of organization. Now, I know that they say the brain can absorb only what the seed can endure, so I hope that uh, we will get to the point, bear with me and I hope it's of some interest to you. Needless to say, the 
Both units were able to thin down after the marches to meet the goal for the table of organization. The regular army boys finally relented and greeted us at the gate as we came running through, not walking through, running through, as some idiot decided that we should run the last half miles of that 149-mile march. <laughs> Thousands of people were cheering us on, and what did the Army have to say? Apparently, the jump school boys had big signs. I saw them. They were there to greet us, and they read, Welcome 3rd Battalion 506, long walkie, big talkie, no jumpy. Usually when a training unit or training regiment satisfactorily completes their basic training as a unit, some division readily grabs them, more especially if they're top-notch and have them assigned to their flag. A division, of course, mostly is about, at that time, at least three or four regiments plus other units in the division to make up that one unit. And notice I said, have them assigned, meaning made part of the division. This was not to be as yet for the 506. The regular army was still smarting. The top brass, the old guard, was still too bullheaded to admit to themselves that we had created such a powerful fighting force in such a short period of time. We went on to Fort Benning and the jump school where they tried every trick in the book to break us, but we were too cocky to stand our ground at every turn. After the Corps, nothing was going to dissuade us. Apparently, the jump school never cared about us at the Corps, and apparently never heard of Curry, nor did they want to hear about it, or the shape we were in. They just could care less. They were the darlings of the United States Army at that time. The 3rd Battalion was attached to the jump school for qualification and obtaining our wings. The first morning at jump school, the entire battalion received a lecture telling us how tough it was going to be for qualifying for our wings. Standing there in front of the darlings of the very special forces of the American Army, they thought they would put the fear of God in us. The officers of the school explained the three steps to qualification. One, a phase, physical buildup to harden your physique. Two, B phase, running about how to pack your own parachute. Three, the C phase, parachute tower technique, tower training, landing skills, and five jumps from an airplane. Before they would begin A phase, they said we had a chance to get out with honor instead of waiting until we voluntarily threw in the towel. No one stepped forward to quit, and then we began double time, running to get in shape. <laughs> and an entire company at a time. We ran and we ran and we ran. I remember it very vividly. The blue stripe boys, as we called them, because they had blue stripes on their shorts and on their shirts, de designating the parach parachute school, blue letters across the chest, U.S. Army Parachute School, they called a halt after running a couple of hours, and they were pouring down with sweat, yelled out, have you had enough? <laughs> we yelled back almost all at once. We thought we were just warming up. Now let's do some real running. <laughs> of course, that made a big hit with those people. <laughs> that was it. No more A phase for the 506. We were harassed at every opportunity by this gang, but its effect made us even tougher. We were given the option to quit before we made our first jump. 
After the first jump, we were told that the guard house and six months at hard labor would be waiting if we, we refused after the first jump. It was okay to refuse the first one. But after the first, no soap. This was due to the government spending so much money to get us where we were, and then to quit. That made sense. I can't remember a single one of us that completed the march from Atlanta that did not qualify his parachute wings. 